Hello, my quilting friends. I'm Leah Day, a professional quilter, author, and online teacher. And this podcast is all about quilting, running a creative business, and balancing our busy hands with our busy lives. You can find the episode show notes and links to everything mentioned in this podcast at leahday.com. Enjoy the show. Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with episode 22 of the podcast. And today I'm sharing an interview with Frances O'Rourke Dow. She is a fiction author and she writes books for children and also she's just gotten into quilting fiction. So I hope that you're looking forward to this interview. Learned a lot from Frances about writing and I just really enjoyed hearing how she took her experiences as a quilter and turned it into a fiction story. You know, just a wonderful story about quilters making quilts. So a little update about what's going on around the house. It's right now June 14th and it's the midpoint of the year and not many people make a big deal about the midpoint of the year. Usually by this time, we've forgotten, you've forgotten about our New Year's resolutions and set all of that stuff aside and it's the summertime and time to kick back and kind of chill out and not really worry about any of the things that we were ambitious about back in January. But this is the time of the year that I always go back to those resolutions and I check back in on my word for the year and really give some thought and intention to the rest of the year to be sure that it's going to be finishing up very successfully. And I'm going to finish the year feeling very satisfied with how things have gone. Uh, there's a wonderful quote from Gretchen Rubin. Uh, I love her books, and I think they're absolutely worth reading if you uh, were looking for something that's really about habits and good habit forming. Uh, Gretchen Rubin, her latest book is uh, Better Than Before, but her quote is, the days are long, but the years are short. And that is absolutely true. Every day feels like eternity, and there's so much to do, and busy, busy, busy. But when you look back at it, it's so short. A year goes by and it's like, you know, where did half the year go? You know, go? I, I, I'm honestly still kind of in January in a lot of ways. <laughs> I'm wishing, actually wishing it was still January because it's really hot right now. But, you know, really tapping into what did I want to get out of this year and am I on track? Uh, so my words for the year were simple and open. I had two. Uh, open kind of came to me at the midpoint of last year, so 2016, and it was, you know, mostly just kind of feeling like I, I had closed myself off to new experiences and feeling like I really wasn't open to trying new things or meeting new people or having fun conversations. And I just kind of, I don't know, I kind of stitched myself into a corner. And as soon as I heard that word open, it just really clicked with me. And I think that honestly, it led to starting the podcast and talking to other quilters and opening up a conversation and reaching out more, which I, I had really tended not to do. So I think that that's been on track well. And, and honestly, I've also been much more open this summer to getting outside. And I know that sounds weird, but I really hate to go outside. <laughs> I'm a quilter. I like to stay inside in wonderful air conditioning and set up my machine. And that is bliss to me. Going outside and getting hot and sweaty and I am allergic to mosquito bites. I get really itchy. Um, that's really no fun. I mean, why do I want to go outside and get all sweaty and gross? So yeah, I've been trying to be more open to that. And Josh and James have been helping me out. I mentioned at the beginning of the summer and uh, as soon as James got out of school, maybe that Saturday, I said something to James about learning how to build a fire. And we live in the country, so we can do this kind of thing, uh, you know, build a fire in the backyard and roast hot dogs and, and stuff like that. And we also have an above ground pool, but this is North Carolina and it's shaded and uh, it's cold, like really cold until mid-July. So what we started doing is having burning swimming days. <laughs> <laughs> we light a fire and get it nice and warm. And I'm, you know, usually cooking something on it, some hot dogs or something like that. And then when we get too hot by the fire, we go and jump in the pool and that's freezing cold and then get out of the pool and go warm up by the fire. So that's been 
really fun and it, it it is an experience that I have to be open to experiencing because I hate smelling like smoke. I don't like getting hot and sticky. I really don't like jumping into a cold pool. I mean, I sound so picky, but this is me. This is who I am. And by kind of going into it on a Saturday afternoon going, this is what I'm doing for the next four hours. I'm staying outside. And for the next four hours, I'm going to be hot and sweaty and get mosquito bitten. And that's okay. And that's been working out great. I think it's all about your mentality and how you're going at it. And um, I don't know, somehow I've rationalized that in my head and it's working out really, really well. And I'm having a really good time with it. Uh, so we've been having those weekends, you know, just about every Saturday, we've been trying to light a fire and have that little ritual. And that's been really fun. This coming Saturday, I'm going to dress up as the flower girl. This is something that I do. I cosplay or dress up in a very elaborate costume and go to fairs and festivals in my area. And I do this mostly to make people happy. It also makes me very happy. It's just really, really fun. It's it's like getting to be someone else, someone very, very different. And this particular costume is a full face mask. It's actually more of a headdress. It's a big, giant flower. Actually, three giant flowers on the top of my head and then a full face mask and then all these ferns and stuff I glued up into the mask. So it's like I have the longest hair in the world. And then I made a hoop skirt and a big ball gown. <laughs> it's just outrageous. I absolutely love it. And the funny thing about it is underneath all of that, I'm wearing uh, shorts and tennis shoes. <laughs> Because I put it on and uh, it's actually, you know, quite a, a, a cool, as in temperature wise, cool costume. And so what I wear under it is just good walking shoes because I'm walking around in shorts so that way I don't get too hot. Uh, so there is an event this coming Saturday and I'm going to be going and, and dressing up. And the wonderful thing about a full face mask is that, you know, no one can see if you're starting to get hot and sweaty and tired and you can make any expression you want underneath. And, you you know, it also limits my reaction to people where all I have are my hands and my and my body. And I have to figure out a way of of um, welcoming someone to take a picture of me without talking because the mask puts so much pressure on my face. I can't talk. So this is another experience that I have pushed myself to be open to. And I'll be honest, when I'm driving to an event, it's scary. And I start running through all of the what ifs in my head. Like, what if someone attacks me? What if someone gets angry with me? What if I get thrown out? Like, you know, what if I, you know, all these terrible things I imagine that are going to happen. And it's like, I have to work through all of that and be okay with it and then be willing to put all of that aside and just go have some fun. You know, that's kind of the point. It's silly and fun and being silly and fun is sometimes scary. So I have a great time with it. And, and that's another experience, definitely an example of being open. Uh, simple. I've been simplifying a lot. I definitely would say I've been minimizing and becoming a bit of a minimalist, at least trying to buy less, less fabric, less supplies, um, you know, just bringing less into my quilting room and my quilting world. And then also finishing using up, doing away with the things that I am no longer attached to or in love with and simplifying that way where if I look at something, it's just like, I absolutely have no desire to finish that. And I don't even want the thing it's going to be when it's over with, you know, letting it go, passing it on to someone else that can finish it. Uh, you know, sometimes some stuff just really just needs to get thrown away and that's okay. Uh, it's okay to throw things away if you're just done with it and not feeling guilty about it. Sometimes when I throw something away, I feel instantly guilty and I want to pull it back out of the trash again. And I have to remind myself, you know, sometimes it's just a blessing for something to stop existing. And that's okay. You know, it's a-okay. And simplifying, I think I need to bring more of this downstairs. Um, my sewing room, I have a, you know, pretty big space downstairs and there's still it still feels like there's a lot of simplifying that needs to happen down there um, whether it's pulling stuff out and making decisions 
uh, and eliminating a lot of the excess. I did this upstairs in my uh, kind of upstairs computer office where I have my Grace Cunique, my long arm set up. That closet in this room, it's a, it's a bedroom and it's got a big closet and it was full to the brim of all kinds of yarn and, and spinning and knitting projects, knitting and crochet projects and stuff like that. And I went through it and I snapped a picture of every single project that was worthy of being saved. And so I have all of those photos and I kind of keep them all organized on my computer. And then as I finish one by one, I can delete those photos. They're no longer needed to remind me of, of what I need to do. Uh, and that's been really useful. I find that kind of changed some habits in the evening. Uh, before I was watching a show with James and just kind of sitting there watching the show. Well, then I changed the habit and said, okay, we're gonna stop watching on the television downstairs where I have no light and I can't do anything. Instead, we're gonna start watching on the iPad upstairs and that way I can have plenty of light in the living room and I can be working on something. And so in a matter of a month and three seasons of Star Wars Clone Wars <laughs> with James, I have managed to put a really big dent on his puff quilt. And I've been thinking about making him a puff quilt for years, but these things take a lot of time and a lot of energy and there are a lot of steps. And so finally sitting down, I finally managed to get him, you know, figure out a system where I could sit there and fold. And I, I figured my system out to be like two nights of folding squares followed by one night of stitching squares. And I found I could stitch these on my hand crank sewing machine. I love pulling that out. It's a Essex miniature sewing machine. You can find these on eBay. That's where I found mine. And it is, it's a little mini hand crank machine that just has one, uh, one thread on the top and I just crank through my puff quilt squares and I am almost done. I think I have just one more night of folding and one more night of stitching and all of the squares will be done and then all I have to do is sew them all together and then I have a finished puffy quilt top. That'll be so great. <laughs> so yeah, I think simplifying has been really good. It's helped me focus in on the projects that I really wanted to finish and to work through them very systematically. Now, that still means that I have quite a lot to do, but I have minimized it down to what I really want to be doing and want to be working on, and that feels really good. So that's it for the updates from Around the House. Our sponsor for this episode is a new workshop that I have just completed. It is the Mega Star Walking Foot Workshop. If you're interested in walking foot style quilting and you'd like to learn how to quilt a real quilt on your home machine, definitely come and check it out. You can find the details at leahday.com slash megastar. And now here's the show. Hello, my quilting friends. Today I'm here with Frances O'Rourke Dow, and she is best known as the author of such novels for children as Debbie Co. and The Secret Language of Girls. More recently, she has been publishing fiction for quilters, including last year's novel, Birds in the Air. Frances is also a longtime podcaster as well. Her podcast, The Off Kilter Quilt, has been on the air for seven years now. Wow. Thank you so much for joining me today, Frances. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. Excellent. So let's get started talking about your new book, Birds in the Air, and how you got into writing quilting fiction. Well, I think I got into writing quilting fiction because I wanted to read more quilting fiction. I, there's something about reading about what you love to do that is absolutely satisfying. And I felt like I'd gone through the Jennifer Chavarini books and the Marie Bostwick books and Sandra Dallas. I felt like I had exhausted my sources, so there was nothing left to do but write my own book. But I also wanted to write about my own experience as a quilter. Um, you know, I, I have spent the last 20 years writing children's fiction, which I love to do. Um, but I kind of wanted to write about being about being an adult and someone who I, I've been quilting for 10 years um, and kind of write about my own quilt story. And a lot of that is in Emma's story and Birds in the Air. Um, so I think that there's a, a rule for writers, which is one reason to write a book is because you want to read a book. You know, you're writing the book that you want to read. So a lot of it was that. Excellent. That sounds great. And I've heard that advice before about writing, like write what you want to read and that makes so much sense to me. It really does. So um, what was it about birds in the air? That's a type of quilt, correct? A type of traditional quilt. 
what what about that made you want to write about that particular type of quilt? Well, I just I, to be quite honest with you, I have I guess it's um, Jenny Jenny Byers. Is that right? I'm sorry. I'm like almost 53 and names and titles completely elude me now. You should come to my book club. We all try to talk about books and we can't remember any of the characters' mm. names or, yeah, anything we've read in the last five years. But anyway, so I have her book of quilt block um, patterns. And so I just started going through. I'm like, all right, what sounds really good to me? And birds in the air, I'm like, oh, that's great. It's a great metaphor. I can name, give my character the last name Bird, which I did. It's B Y R D. Um, and it, it's Emma Bird, B-Y-R-D, but it just seemed like it had so many possibilities, and it's a very, you know, it's a beautiful, very simple block, so I liked that um, about it as well, that that would be an appealing block for a new culture, if she, you know, so all those things, but really, I just liked the name, Birds in the Air, it's like, oh, great title, I'll do this, and I should say, I'm working on the sequel, and I did the same thing, so the sequel is called Stars Upon Stars, because I was like, oh, great title, so it's really that. I started out as a poet, so that's partly how I make my decisions. It's also how I bet on horses, which means I never win. <laughs> oh. they, they always come in last. <laughs> oh, well, I think that's so cool. You know, sometimes when I'm planning a sampler... I'll flip through. I have that book, too, right here, actually, next to me. Uh, it's it's uh, her massive book of blocks. Uh, yeah. I think it's, yeah, I think I've been working on a, on a, I've been working on something, so, of course, it's in the other room. But, uh, you know, I just flip through. I'm like, what looks good to me? But also, the name can make or break whether I pick a block or not, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, because it's like, oh, I don't like that name all that much. I might, I might pick another one. <laughs> so, um, I read the book. Uh, I loved it. I thought it was excellent. And, you know, and what was interesting is you captured Emma as a beginning quilter, as someone that, honestly, she really had never even had any desire to make a quilt ever. And yeah. you captured that beginner state, but you've been quilting, obviously, for a really long time. So how was that to write that and tap back into that perspective? Well, it was um, it was fun because now I feel so accomplished. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I have, you know, I've been podcasting for seven of the 10 years that I've been quilting and it's fun. And there's people who have been listening to me all of those seven years. And so I'll put up a quilt now and they're like, Francis, I can, do you remember your old quilts? You know, and I do, I, I, I remember very much, I mean, because partly it's like learning anything, whether you're learning to quilt or you're learning, I don't know if it's equivalent to learning new language, but learning to do something new. I, I think the process is pretty similar, whatever it is. And there's that, you know, there's the excitement about doing it. There's also the frustration because you look at beautiful quilts and you think, I want to make this beautiful quilt. And guess what? It's going to take you years, maybe your entire life to make that beautiful quilt that's inspired you. So there is that feeling of, wow, I'm not very good at this, and maybe I'm not meant to do this. And so, But also the joys of very early successes, like you make, you, you sew four little two-and-a-half-inch squares together into a little block, and you're like, oh, my, and you run around, like, around the neighborhood showing everyone, look, look, I sewed these four little squares together, and everyone's kind of patting you on the head. But, you know, that excitement, too, and actually I think that's one of the great things about quilt making is it's a sharp learning curve to get, accomplished but really all you have to do is sew some things together sew some pieces of fabric together and keep doing that over and over and you can have a have a quilt so I really remember that the thrill of doing that and I look at my early quilts and they're funny to me but they're also dear to me because I was excited and then you just want to go on and make another quilt and you slowly realize what it is you have to learn to you know it's like the half square triangle which I feel like I'm still learning I'm getting better I think 10 years from now, I may have it down. But um, so it's, it's a, you have early successes that spur you on and keep you going. But there's also, you do, you know, I, I, and because being stupid or dumb is also a really big part of my learning process, because partly for me to learn to do something, I have to do it. And that's how I learned to quilt. The first two quilts I made, I did on my, one I completely made up, the other I got from an Amy Butler book. And then I went and took the class, where and, and which is, and that's just my process. So I remember all of that very clearly. But it's, I think for me, that is my learning process, whatever it is. But the love of quilts and just the love of doing this is such, you know, it's so satisfying to 
to make a quilt and just be in that creative space and making stuff. I think making, you know, I, I think human beings are meant to be makers. I think we're makers. Um, so, so yeah, I remember it all really well. And, um, both the, both the joy of it and the frustration and, um, and also getting help from other people. And that's such a big part of, I think most quilters journeys. Um, nowadays we can get help from, you know, videos online or going to Missouri quilting company and watching the, the videos and all that. But, um, I feel all the way along I, people have helped me and, you know, even on the quotes I'm doing now, which are much better quotes, but I, you know, I'm a part of a group and I'm like, I'll say, here's what I'm doing. What am I doing wrong? And they will tell me, <laughs> but that's great. So, uh, that, that part stays the same. And I think the part about you're always learning stays the same, which is why we stay young and gorgeous <laughs> until we're 90 because we're using our brains and we're alive and um, being that. creative. Exactly. I completely agree with that. And, you know, tapping into that beginner mindset, uh, you know, it's tough when, you know, you probably kind of know how to piece most of this stuff, but writing it, you wrote it in a way that I, I felt like Emma was very genuine. So that, that was really good. So you based the book in North Carolina and I got such a kick out of that. Uh, North Carolina is my home state and, uh, you know, I don't, have you lived here your whole life? I have not. I'm an army rat. So I came here when I was 18 to go to Wake Forest, which is in Winston-Salem. And I went away up to Massachusetts for graduate school and got really, really cold <laughs> and came back to the Triangle area of North Carolina, which is Durham, Chapel Hill, and Raleigh. And I've lived in this area mostly since then with but, um, a foray into East Tennessee right across the line from Mitchell County and um, from Sweet Anne's Gap is the town, mm -hmm. the birds in the air. It's made up. It's kind of a combination of Bakersville and Spruce Pine, where my in-laws had a mountain house. And when my husband and I lived in East Tennessee, we spent a lot of time in Bakersville, and even before then. So I've spent a lot of time in the mountains of North Carolina and lived in Boone um, for a while while I was writing my first children's novel. So I have lived in North Carolina a long time and have spent a good deal of time up in the mountains, which I love. Yeah, and I, everyone has that. A lot of people have that fantasy when you go vacation in the mountains, and you think, "What if oh, I could buy this old house and live the simple life?" And I was like, "There is no simple life, but it's such a nice fantasy." <laughs> oh, it certainly is. I completely agree. I just I loved all of the references, you know, because I kind of figured that Sweet Anne's Gap was a made up place. Um, so just simply because I live in Shelby, North Carolina, which is south of Gastonia, and I've lived in Asheville, and the, uh -huh. the distances between places, I was like, that's maybe not, <laughs> but I could actually do the math on it. And it was yeah. interesting. It just, I don't know, that made it more special for me coming from North Carolina and I've lived here my whole life and I love North Carolina. Um, I just, you know, there's nowhere else I want to live, honestly. Um, so I just love that. Um, what made you want to base the book here? And was there anything in particular? Well, I think, you know, it's funny because Emma moved, and her family, they moved from Chapel Hill, which is the area I live in. I live in Durham, up to the mountains. Um, one, I like knowing the settings that I write in, even if I have a generic setting in a book. When some of my children's novels, they're not placed in a specific town. I have a, a specific place in mind, some place that I've lived growing up. Um, so I like knowing settings, but also, again, what I was saying, that, that idea, you know, living in this area, which is... Um, there are a lot of universities, there's IBM, there's all this stuff, and it's it's a pretty, in some ways, mainstream suburban life, and if you've got kids, and they're all running around, it's like, oh my goodness, soccer again, <laughs> you know, and so that, again, that idea, and then you go up to the mountains, and it's beautiful, and seemingly serene, so I, I saw, and, and I know that area, which is fictionally, I call it Morgan County, there's not a Morgan County in North Carolina, but it's Mitchell County, and so just, yeah, so I wanted a place that I could walk characters around in and visualize, I think, for a lot of people, the mountains, again, represent that a kind of bucolic, simple life, and, um, which is, and it's not simple, right? It, you know, no place is simple, but, but I did want to be able to visualize uh, the setting, because that's important to me. And, and, and know it, and I, and I do, not as well, obviously not half as well as someone who grew up in Spruce Pine or Bakersville, but I've been there, and I can be Emma as the stranger who's moved into town. That I can do. So 
Um, but yeah, it's in, in North Carolina. It's you know it's been my home for a long time now. My husband is from Charlotte, and his people are from Stanley and Gastonia. <laughs> so, so it's just all it's all in the gene pool now. <laughs> Absolutely, oh, I th- I really enjoyed that. So let's talk a little bit about your writing process. So. Do you get up and write at a certain time every day? You know, do you write with a special pen? <laughs> like, how do you how do you sit down and make yourself write? I'm very much a creature of routine. Um, I do not wait for inspiration because you never get anything done. So I do. I write at the same time every day. I usually sit down between. Uh, usually it's ten. I usually write from about ten to one. So I get up and I've got children to deal with and the dog to walk and I do all of that and um, and then I, I actually I, I write on a computer. I usually start on the couch, but then I'm, I have a treadmill desk because it's really not good to sit <laughs> there for three hours straight. So I also work at my, my treadmill desk. And I do my best. To, yeah, it's usually the first 20 minutes I'm, like, trying to stay off Facebook. It's so tempting. They're like, oh, I just need to check this out. Or I wonder if so-and-so liked my post. And, like, you kind of got to work through that noise, which is some way, sometimes why I try to start at 930 to get that out of my system. But once I get to work, I'm pretty good about staying focus and, and, and working for several hours. Um, and I do that Monday through Friday and that's how you get books written. Absolutely. <laughs> and I write really bad first drafts, uh, but I, I know that I do, so I don't panic. <laughs> and, um, and usually it, it takes three or four drafts to get to a finished book, sometimes more. And every once in a while, just a couple with some of the shorter children's books that I do, they're easier to get a good first draft and a, and a full revision on the second draft. But that's pretty much it. Now, do you plot or pants? Like, uh, fly by the seat of your pants, or do you plot the whole book out? <laughs> I pants. I'm a pantser. <laughs> I just have, you know, I think I need an element of surprise for myself. I often, at the end of a day, know where I'm going to start the next day. And I have ideas about where I think the story is going. But, I don't, and you know, there are writers who plot, you know, um, Ann Patchett is a writer I love. She's got it all imagined in her head. She's got it all outlined. And she still wants to write the book after she does that. But for me, I'd be like, all right, well, I know the story. I'm not interested. And I have to be interested. And I also believe um, that the subconscious does a lot of work. And I'm often surprised where I, I start out thinking this chapter is going to be about such and such. And I'll, I mean, I'm, by the end of it, I'm like, wow, how did I get here? But that's part of my favorite part of the process is those surprises. So no, And also, I'm terrible at plots, so why bother? <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, the books have plots, so, I promise. But... You know, any plot I come up with beforehand is just like would be ridiculous. So I like the organic approach to, to creating a plot. That makes it's sense. Also, yeah, that's why I end up doing a lot of drafts because a lot of times the first draft really is in, going in search of a plot. Okay. And sometimes finding it, yeah. So, um, so you write the whole first draft. I'm just I'm trying to break, kind of break it down just so I understand it a little bit better in your process. So you, you write the whole first draft, and then do you go back through and rewrite, tweak, and add scenes, or do you just start all over again for the second draft? Um, I, well, what I do is I give it to an editor. Oh. <laughs> That's that's and um, so with my children's books, I um, I've worked with the same editor at Simon and Schuster for almost twenty years now because we first started working on the first book in two thousand no in nineteen ninety eight, um, and so usually well, usually what I'll do is with the first draft I'll I, I I've been doing it long enough now that I can go through and do an initial revision, but then I send it to Caitlin. Um, now, Birds in the Air and the, and Stars Upon Stars, is actually, we are, and when I say we, it's me and my husband, Clifton, have started a publishing company. We, we wanted to see if we could put it out successfully ourselves. I, I felt like because I have a reputation as a writer in the children's book world, I probably could have found an agent and sold it. But we just kind of always wanted to try that. So I actually, for Birds in the Air, had three editors <laughs> Because that's what it takes to equal um, my editor, Caitlin, in New York. Um, but but my husband um, worked in publishing and is an excellent editor. And then I had two friends, Kristen and Sandy, who are friends of mine through Quilting Circles, who are excellent editors. And they um, were amazing. They gave me great. So I sent them the first draft and and then you know got notes from everyone. And they all read it again as well, which was that to me is like, that's that's a friend. <laughs> 
Um, and so, but I, I am very dependent on editors and that's, you know, I'm a very big believer that writing is rewriting and everyone needs an editor actually in all aspects of our lives. <laughs> we need editors and coaches, but with writing, you really can't do it. It's so hard to really look at your own writing and stand back enough far away from it, uh, and to, to really know, um, what needs to happen and partly because the story is existing in your mind and some of that story in your mind isn't making it onto the page. Um, so anyway, so, so once I do my own revision, then I give it to an editor and get feedback and I've been doing that long enough that it only hurts my feelings, a, you know, a little bit or well, <laughs> no, pretty, I'm pretty good at taking, at, at getting feedback and using that, um, and revising. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a continual revising process. I'm so glad that you said that because, you know, uh, you write something down and, and just getting that extra set of eyes on it and the tweaks here and there, it just really yeah. does tighten it up and make it such a big difference. So talking about your writing now, how does this relate to your quilting? Like, is your, is your quilts the same way? Do you, do you pants your quilts? <laughs> Same way. Dude, you know, more and more I pants my quilts. I just love this pants as a verb. This is going to be my new thing. Uh, I do. Now, I, I, it's been interesting the last couple of years I've been designing my own quilts. And I think I've just gone through the evolution that a lot of people go through. You start out with patterns and then you're, you use patterns, but you mess around with the patterns and make it more what you want it to be. And then you just start eyeballing stuff and go, oh, you know, I really like that. Now, here's what I would do. And you start making up your own patterns. And then you're just, you're getting ideas all on your own, not even looking at other people's quilts. And I started doing that a couple of years ago, just like, I need a baby quilt. And I saw like Denise Schmidt's string quilt. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to do that. And you just figure, you can figure it out. Although my math skills are so bad sometimes. I just amaze myself with like, really, you thought that was going to work, but I mean, a string quilt I can do. Um, but when I was writing birds in the air, you know, Emma finds, um, a quilt in her attic. Cause everyone, every quilting novel should have a quilt in the attic. Every quilting novel should have an attic, um, period. But, and I thought, Oh, you know, I should make this. She finds a civil war era quilt. I'm like, oh, I should make this. And so I started making that. And then a friend of mine invited me to kind of do the, the creamer premiere for birds in the air at her guild in Atlanta. She's like, and bring quilts. I'm like, I give all my best quilts away. <laughs> I don't have any quilts to bring besides this one I'm working on. So I started, I'm like, well, I need some quilts to, for a trunk show. And I really, I, the first one I thought, I love modern quilts. I make a lot of modern quilts. I'm like, Oh, I should do a modern birds in the air. And that was totally pants. <laughs> That was, to, I just started playing around and figuring out, like, what should the birds be? Let's make the birds chevrons. Let's do that. And um, so it was weird because it doesn't look like an improvised quilt, but it was totally improvised and then revised. And a lot, I think that the process is really similar for me um, and that I, I have an idea and I play around with it. And then I do a lot of revising with my quilts now as well. And sometimes I make second drafts. It's, it's cheaper as a writer <laughs> to revise than it is as a quilter. Um, but I do a lot of revising, which I love. I, I love the design process. It's kind of, it's a problem solving process, which is the same with plot. You know, you have to figure out the problem of the plot. What, how does your character get from the beginning of the story to the end and what gets in her way and what, you know, what are the obstacles she has to overcome and designing quilts is, is a problem solving process as well. Um, especially because I don't sit down um, with EQ7 because I'm still trying to figure out EQ7 <laughs> or even on a paper um, that much. I'm usually designing on my design wall and just trying to figure things out. But I enjoy it. I get frustrated, and it's it's very similar to writing again where you get to a point where, like, this is really bad, and that's when you need to go to bed <laughs> and maybe come in the morning and things will look better. Uh, but I, I, do, I, I think it's just the creative process for me, which is idea – and execution of the idea and then and then revising and getting it to where you want it to be and sometimes also being really surprised by where you end up because it's not where you thought you would absolutely, absolutely. allowing the space for whatever happens to happen and you're right this is so much cheaper when you can just delete text <laughs> yeah. oh my goodness, i need to order some more fabric from carrie quilting company which i'm Shout out to my local quilting shop, by the way. Uh, but, it, you know, you just like, oh, boy. and go, yeah, Because I've just totally messed this up. But um, but it's still fun 
but expensive. Absolutely. So uh, let's talk about publishing real quick, since you mentioned that you and your husband kind of came together and decided to do this book differently. So um, tell me about how that process worked uh, and getting it out there. And then how are the books doing being independently published? Um, so to how we, we, it was, it's very much like the process, uh, um, <laughs> what I do with Simon Schuster, except that we had to pay. <laughs> a little more used to getting paid up front, uh, but that's okay. But it, so you go through the the revision process, and it went through several rounds. And then uh, my husband Clifton uh, copy edited it, which we decided that next time it will be worth paying someone lots and lots of money to do that. That's a really hard job. It was humbling for me because I get really cranky with my copy editors for my children's books. And now I'm like, oh, wow, that is a hard job. I am now very humble and say thank you, thank you for correcting things. Um, and so, and then and you, so you proofread, you copy edit, you send it to people to, to read through, to catch things. Um, you send it to get blurbed. I was really lucky um, or blessed or just fortunate that Marianne Fonz is like the nicest person in the world. And so I just contacted her via Facebook and said, can I send you this novel? And if you like it, will you blurb it? And she was like, yeah. And she gave it a beautiful blurb and also caught some some errors, some copy editing errors. So it was sort of a double win for me. Um, and then it's how do you get the book out there? And it's helpful for me to have a podcast and, and have a, a, a good, strong base and also really good friends. And so, for instance, one of the things like I asked people to do, we had cards made up, little calling cards. And people who listen to the podcast were great. I'm like, let me know. Can I send you cards? And will you take them to your quilt shop and, you know, into quilting conferences or conventions? And people did. In fact, I've got another pack. A friend of mine is like spending her whole summer, I think, at quilting events and she's like send me more cards I'll send them out and also getting you know I sent I contacted bloggers and so you know can I send you an advanced copy and if you like it will you write about it and people did um you know so it's you have to be more creative with the marketing but to be honest that's one of the reasons we decided to start our own company which is called Milton Falls Media because we knew with children's books there's a lot of there are marketers there's a lot of because so many of the books go through librarians, it's, it's a different system. When you're publishing for adults, it's like you have to do so much of your own marketing and publicity. And I thought, well, if I'm, doing, if I'm writing the book and marketing it and publicizing it, I want to try, if I'm going to have to do that work anyway, I would actually like you know, most of the profits. If, and, and it's done really well. I think we've sold over 10,000 copies, and it's, but it's really, I've yeah, been really, um, I've had a lot of help from friends and from people who've been receptive. And then um, just recently, <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. It's like a couple of people have have mentioned it. I'm like, oh, what am I thinking about? It's in, and she's in she's on Winston and Scrappy and Bonnie um, Hunter. Bonnie Hunter. I have to see. This is the problem with being 53. I'm like, I can see her face. I can see her quilts. I owe her so much love. But she, I said, I asked her. I'm like. Will you read it? And she did, and she blogged about it on the quilt felt Facebook site. And also, you know, and all of a sudden, it's like we're watching the pings coming through Amazon as people are like, "Oh, okay, I'll buy that." You know, so it's been really wonderful. Um, this, you know, just, just but people and you doing this, you doing this interview, and the people will hear about the book, and the people will tell friends, and so it's been a lot of fun, and we're learning a lot about marketing and publicity. Um, from this, and so, so, and it's been successful because I think cultures like to read about quilting, and we'll give a shot, you know. So Absolutely. okay, and particularly, it's like a, some Amazon is very interesting, but they will lower the Kindle version, the ebook, to two ninety nine, and so people are like, okay, I'll try it for two ninety nine. So um, it's been an adventure, and uh, yeah, but I really uh, have really appreciated all the help that people have have given the book. So I've been really lucky. 
Yeah, you know, it's so funny. How I even learned about it was Bonnie Hunter tagged me in a post because she was like, oh, I've been enjoying Birds in the Air. And it's so funny, Leah Day Quilting shows up in the middle. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm in this book. <laughs> so, of course. <laughs> the meaning, and this is the problem with doing this and doing all these other things. I'm like, you are on my list of people to contact. And then I think Bonnie just made that happen for us. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it was yeah. it was so, honestly, it was like, oh, my gosh, this made my, like, whole month. Like, I yeah. felt so honored. And so then when I read the book, it was just a treat to see like it, what happened was um the character was looking at books and she was trying to learn how to piece and she picked up my book and it helped her piece and so tell me about picking real quilters and real quilting tools like you mentioned carol doak you mentioned a yeah. quilting tool the um it was like a tri- triangle spinner or something like that i can't remember what the it was bangles, the bangles bangle. yeah just because i like saying bangles <laughs> <laughs> so what made you pick these different things well, some is, you know, one is, um, I mean, who do we learn paper piecing from? We learn it from Carol Doak. And, and, and that's my mother is uh, also a quilter. She started quilting just a few years before I did. And so she sent me a DVD, when, you know, about, uh, you know, Carol Doak DVD. So partly it's you know, using recognizable names. And I was thinking, well, you know, if, you, if who would, it, you know, who's written about, you know, how to piece, and you have, I'm like, well, and people know Leah Day, and so, so I felt like other people would relate to that part of Emma's journeys, like, who would you go to, what books would you pick up, and I think, well, I picked up Leah Day's books, every, you know, so why wouldn't Emma, <laughs> kind of thing, you know, um, that those would be reference books that people would look at to learn how to quilt or improve skills or what have you so and it's really fun and and I actually another thing my mother you know because I was always complaining about half square triangles she's like oh you should try bangles I'm like they you know they they helped a little bit but then so ultimately I thought maybe more trouble than they were worth but I know a lot of people love them and it's a great way um if you're having problems with accuracy it's worth a try mm-hmm. so Again, like the word bangle. So I wanted to incorporate stuff that contemporary cultures would go, yes, because it's fun. You know, when you read a book, you're like, yeah, I tried bangles, or oh, I love Carol Dover, I love Leah Day. You know, it just makes it fun for and, readers, I think. And I think that that in itself, you know, I mean, hey, it hooked me, you know, and I mean, as a professional culture, I was like, now I really love this book, you know, so I think, you know, it's a good marketing idea, too. I mean, just from that angle, I mean, that might sound a little bad, but hey, I I threw professional culture's names in a book any day. Um, So for the next book who else can I <laughs> Bonnie, I threw in and uh, finished almost finished with the first draft of the next book and I did throw in Bonnie Hunter just you know one because people love Bonnie I'm like also a little shout out because I appreciate her <laughs> absolutely I think that's wonderful so that leads right into another idea I had and that was uh, have you considered writing some nonfiction books that would tie into your novel like a book on how to make several different birds in the air patterns uh, in addition, that would kind of tie into like birds in the air, the quilts. Right. Have you considered that? Not doing books. I am doing. I'm see, and, and I'm not a pattern maker. So, but, but I did do this quilt, Modern Birds in the Air. It got to Quilt Con. I was very excited. And my friend Adele uh, Amison, who knows how to do things like EQ7 and math, which just impresses me to no end, um, has actually written the pattern for the modern birds in the air. So, yes, I would like to do patterns and actually have them um, available on, on, you know, the website or what have you. Um, so, But as far as doing an official book, <laughs> that's a little scary to me. But I love that. But so, But, yes, so, yes, I have thought about that. And that's another thing where I will need help from my friends Um, because I can figure out stuff for myself, but don't always trust myself then to translate that for other people, what I have done. Um, But I actually am very interested in writing about quilting, not so much how to, but, but quilting itself. I'm very interested in quilt history. I'm really interested. Like I said, I make all kinds of quilts, but, um, I'm really interested in the modern quilt movement, like how did that come about, and have been doing a little bit of writing about that, because I'm interested, I I love quilts, and I started making quilts because I loved quilts, and I finally kind of got over my fear of fractions, (laughs) quite frankly, um, to, to start making quilts, but I'm also interested, you know, quilting, there's this, the old 
not argument, but the old question is, is quilting a hobby, a craft, or an art? It's not a hobby, and I really, I hate it when people say, oh, that's so nice, you have such a nice hobby. It's like, it's not collecting bottle caps. <laughs> it's really a different thing. Um, but it is a craft, and it, but it's also oftentimes an art, and it's a way that for hundreds of years, at least 200 years in this country, women were able to take their creative energies and channel them into making something that was useful, but sometimes quite beautiful. Not every quilt is beautiful. We know that. We all have quilts in our closets that we've made that are really far from beautiful. But I find quilts, um, some of my favorite works of art are, are quilts. And so I'm interested as someone, and this is in the book uh, as well for Emma, you know, she, cause she talking about growing up and boys would say, if women are the same as men, if women are equal to men, where are the great women artists? And when you're kids, you don't know how to answer that. And that was coming to me in the mid-70s, so kind of when the second wave of feminism had just kind of trickled into the suburbs, you know. But um, I didn't know to say, go look at those quilts your granny made, and then you can come talk to me about great artists, because some of those quilts, some of those double wedding rings, I, they're, I think they're great works of art. So that's something that I'm interested in thinking about and writing about. How And, and what I love about quilting, too, it, what's strange to me is no one knows we do it. It is a you know $4 billion a year industry. There's 16 million active quilters in this country. But if you talk to people who don't quilt, they're like, really? People still make quilts? I'm like, yeah, people still make quilts. That's, those quilting <laughs> magazines at the grocery store, that might suggest to you that people still make quilts. But... Um, yeah, so I just it's it's interesting to me this uh, that that so many people we get great joy and are making really beautiful things and these gifts that you know quilters largely exist in a gift economy. We make our quilts; they cost hundreds of dollars just in materials, not to mention time, and we give them away. And I just I'm, I'm interested in all of that, um, and and that how hidden it is from the the mainstream culture. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's so interesting. Whenever you mention, hey, I'm a quilter, usually you'll get a response back of, oh, my grandmother made quilts. Oh, my yeah. great grandmother made quilts. I don't yeah. think that it's hidden so much as it's just not the association with um, this still goes on or um, that, you know, here someone that's younger and I make quilts, you know, sometimes yeah. uh, I get uh, kind of an initial reaction from other women and that is, oh, that's cute. What does your husband do? <laughs> <laughs> like it becomes cute and it also right. becomes like my plaything. obviously right. not something that would actually, you know, be a business, be successful, that kind of thing. And I have to bite back my level of resentment whenever I get that kind of thing because it's like, Oh, I want to bite your head off now because <laughs> it's not that's true. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> yes. I mean, literally, that's that's so cute. You know, that's kind of what I get. So I completely understand what you're saying. And um, what's interesting is, you know, I've been doing a lot of nonfiction writing, you know, writing how-to books and writing. And sometimes these are, you know, quite long processes to make sure that you've got all the information right. And I had a friend who's a fiction writer and her advice was, why don't you go write some fiction and then you don't yeah. have to take any pictures of the quilt. What great advice. I love I that. I know. And like, you know, mixing the two together, I think is so nice because what quilter wouldn't want to make the birds in the air quilt? You know, yeah. I mean, as, as soon as I read the, the book and then when the quilt popped up, it's like, I want to see that. I yeah. want to see that yeah. quilt. And I want to go maybe piece of birds in the air blog. And yeah. the one thing I would have to say, just a little bit of encouragement, nudging you in that direction, <laughs> a book is only five to seven patterns in one place. Yeah. So if you can do five to seven patterns separately and sell those separately on your site, you could just put them all together and then it becomes a non, you know, nonfiction book. I, 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 I do feel encouraged, and that makes it sound so easy. <laughs> it's straight for just five to seven matters. It is something I would, I would have to do. Maybe I can talk my friend to doubt. <laughs> there you go. And it'll be like dot, dot, dot three years later. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Coming to a website near you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I've had so much fun talking with you today. And this is the last question I always ask everybody. And that is, what are you most excited about in the next five years? What you got cooking for quilting, for personal, anything you want to share? I am, uh, you know, I have been working on short stories, which I love. And if I have a site, it's quiltfiction.com. And I've published some short stories on there. I'm really excited about, about those, um, about working more 
in short stories and doing some short story collections. And I'm very excited about, I've just, I'm really, uh, it's hard to predict for five years. And my life is going to be very different in five years because I have, uh, my, my older son is about to graduate from high school. And in five years, my younger son will have graduated from high school. So his life will be very different. Um, but I'm always excited about, uh, so, like, right now, I'm really excited about applique, but that doesn't seem grand enough. What is your big dream? Oh, I want to applique more, <laughs> but I am. So I'm just excited about making more quilts and just seeing where the process leads me. And I do think, again, as I said, I think human beings are just innately so creative, and we're, we're so happy when we're making because we're engaged both, you know, intellectually, we're engaged physically, um, that's my thing. I also knit, but knitting has really gone by the wayside. And my, my motto is knitting is sitting, quilting is moving, <laughs> you know, and I love the different stations of quilting. Um, but even, I, I don't, now I'm losing my train of thought, but I'm looking forward to, oh, cause we're makers engaged body, soul, um, and intellect. And so just the thought of, I get to keep doing this. Um, I'm going to keep writing stories and I'm going to keep make, making quilts and sometimes there are going to be some intersections between the two and that's exciting for me as well. But that's, I just get, I'm not a big planner. So I plan for my children to be successfully launched into this world as fine and decent human beings. And I plan on making more quilts and writing more stories. Wonderful. Well, I can't wait to read them. So tell everybody where they can find you online. You can find me at uh, quiltfiction.com. You can, that's where you can find stories. I, because I have many different lives, <laughs> you can find me in different places. If you're interested in my children's books, that's francisdow.com. And you can also find, that will lead you to various things. If you're interested in my quilt fiction, go to quiltfiction.com. And if you want to listen to my podcast, that's the Off Kilter Quilt on iTunes. So I'm just everywhere. Uh, I need to consolidate probably no it sounds like you're doing pretty good you've got many different facets and they all have their home so i think that's great thank, thank you thank, thank you. you so much for joining me today oh thank you so much for having me it's been really fun to talk to you so that's it for this episode if you'd like to find more episodes of the hello my quilting friends podcast check it out at leahday.com slash podcast we have a player that will play through all of the episodes shared so far, so you can binge listen for hours on end. Until next time, let's go quilt.